Hello! Today I want to talk about the One Ring 2nd Edition Core Rulebook. I start by giving you an overview of the book, of the rules. I try to be brief, but really this is a, a massive rules book. So it takes me about half an hour. And then at the end I'm giving you my opinion about it. So if you're only interested in that, I'll leave a timestamp down below so you can just jump to the conclusion. Anyway, uh, consider liking and subscribing and let's get into the book. Okay, let me show you what this is about without going through all of the book. I'll skim through large parts. Inside cover. This is, if you will, a player map of the region where this is set, Eriador, which is in the northwest of Middle-earth, with the Shire at its center. So the One Ring is not set in the entirety of Middle-earth. You can play wherever you want, but this is like the default region. And in the back, we've got pretty much the same map, but as a hex map. Because the travel rules that are copied in here for convenience, that's very cool, use uh, the hex grid to determine uh, how long travel takes and what might happen during travel. Prologue just explains what a role playing game is about. Illustrations are really nice. Love both the color illustrations and the pencil black and whites. Action resolution is uh, the re dice rolling system. So it works like this. You've got abilities and you try to roll over a target number. Your ability lowers the target number you have to beat with your dice. And what you usually do, you take a feed die, a d12, always take one of those, then a number of skill dice according to your skill, for example, three. And with all of these, you try to beat a target number. If you are good in something, that might be a 13. If you are bad in an attribute, that might be an 18. So you have got five, 12, 17, this is pretty good. Then we've got the rune of Gandalf that gives you an automatic success. And we've got the Eye of Sauron that gives you automatic failure, but only if your characters are miserable. So in this game, rest and recreation is actually pretty important to keep not only your character's physical condition up, but also their mental condition. Because if your characters get exhausted and they're losing hope, the dice rolling system becomes more punishing and you're prone to more failures. Additionally, you can have a bonus or malus feed die, depending on if you have feats or if the situation is really dire. And depending on the situation, you can get bonus D6, for example, if someone of your party is helping you, the task is really easy, if you've got good equipment, and you can lose D6 if the situation is really hard if you're trying to climb without proper equipment, if the weather is really bad, for example. So that is how the GM modifies the challenge of a roll, rather than modifying the target number. As I said, the target number is set by your ability score. If you roll a 6 you roll a 6, that is also marked by an elven rune on this special die set. You get additional quality for your rolls that can be used to go beyond a normal success. And, for example, in combat it can be used to do more damage or even score critical runes 
uh, even though the enemy still has hit points, thus potentially ending a fight quickly. Some rolls might even require that you roll the number of sixes to have any meaning. Said you've got a number of uh, conditions. Miserable, that is if your shadow rating is higher than your hope rating. So the players lower their hope rating themselves by spending hope points to get more d6 for a task. And they gain shadow for bad things that happen during the adventure. And you have to manage to always keep your hope up and your shadow down. Else, if you're miserable, the Eye of Sauron will be an automatic value. Rarely. If your endurance rating, which is pretty much your physical hit points, is lower than the load you're carrying, you're wearing, you become exhausted, you are weary. And if that is the case, all 1, 2s or 3s on the D6 aren't counted at all. So that makes it much harder to succeed at a roll. And you can uh, avoid that by resting and recovering your endurance or by carrying a really low load. And I imagine that during an adventure when you become wary, so you might have to abandon some of your equipment to lower your load so you are lo no longer wary. And you can continue to chase the orcs that have taken Merry and Pippin across the plains of Rowan. Finally, if you are wounded, pretty much if you've got a critical hit, and you remain active, you've got a chance of getting knocked out and you recover endurance much slower. So uh, you try to avoid that. There's the character sheet with a good explanation of it. And venture creation. So we've got a number of uh, cultures and species your character can be from and depending on that you've got a different set of attributes. You don't distribute attribute points, just take one of these sets or roll to take one of these sets and that gives you your attributes. And the culture also gives you a starting number of skills, even favorite skills that would be appropriate to someone of this culture. And a special cultural blessing, for example, here the Bardings have that their Valor rolls are favorites. Every time they try to resist getting frightened, they get an additional d12. Got Dwarves, Elves, Hobbits, Men of Bree, Rangers of the North, and then we are to your professions, which give you additional favorite skills, additional features, and also a shadow path. We've got Captain, Champion, Messenger, Scholar, and Warden. No thieves in here, because the default setting assumes that every member of your party is rightfully good in D&D terms. They do as is expected of a hero. And you gain shadow points if you don't. Also, no wizards. That is because in the setting of Lord of the Rings, there are only a very few wizards that are more like angels than a uh, normal learned scholarly human. So this is a setting that is actually very low in magic. And the few wizards that are in the world are important campaign NPCs like Gandalf the Grey or Saruman the White.
that is uh, thematically appropriate. We've got our equipment. Uh, what I noticed here is that all of these weapons and armors are pretty early medieval. So there's no plate armor, and no halberds, no huge two-handed swords. There aren't even any crossbows and, God forbid, pistols. But this is the appropriate equipment for the setting as described in the books. And I'm personally a fan of the early medieval period from an aesthetic standpoint. The company. It is assumed that your adventuring group has a safe haven like a home base, for example the town of Bree or maybe Rivendell. And they have one or more patrons that they see regularly, that they do favors for or uh, get favors from. These are pretty well known characters from the Lord of the Rings like Barleen, Bilbo or Gandalf the Grey. One thing that this game has a focus on is that adventurers eventually retire or die, but you have the opportunity to raise an heir before that. Someone who will continue your character's legacy, who will inherit your great war gear, your magical items. And if you invest a lot of experience point in raising an heir, that heir starts with more experience, more feats, and generally has a better start than your last character. But it is a big investment of experience points. This is again kind of thematic with The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. For example, we've got Frodo who has inherited the adventuring career from Bilbo, and with that he has inherited the Mithril Chainmail and the Dagger the Short Sword Sting. Or uh, Gimli, son of Gloin. Gloin is a character from The Hobbit, and Gimli has inherited his father's adventuring career, basically. I could also see that you have a mixed group. You've got a uh, few humans, hobbits, maybe an elf. And while the humans will have to raise an heir and change characters regularly, so to speak, the elf might just be the, the same character throughout several generations. That might be interesting. Got a good number of skills, combat proficiencies, axes, bows, spears and swords. These basically act like skills. We've got distinctive character features. So something that your character is like patient, secretive. You can invoke these distinct features if it is applicable to a given situation, to a given skill check. So your character becomes inspired. That means if you spend a whole point to get an extra d6, instead get two. Valor and Wisdom. This is tied to the progression system, to, if you will, the level system. Your characters can spend their experience points to upgrade their skills, to raise their skill levels, or you can put them in Wisdom or Valor. New ranks in Valor will give you better and improved war gear because your character has become more famous and his family or his faction will bestow upon him better war gear. So rather than just buying it or just finding it somewhere, it is tied to your character's identity. Though there are items you can find during adventuring, especially magical items you will find during your adventures. But if you decide to raise your wisdom stat, you are bestowed with new virtues. There's a number of them and they are basically like 
feats in D&D. They give you a special ability. Adventuring phase, this is basically the detailed rules how everything works. So we've got the combat rules in here. Interestingly, this doesn't use uh, complicated rules for range or movement at all. The start of the battle, the two sides can exchange an opening volley and depending on how far they are apart, GM's discretion, that might be two, three or more opening volleys and then they are in close quarters and you have to use melee weapons. Only one of your party can stand back and still use a bow. So this whole system would work well with Theater of the Mind or Ultimate Dungeon Terrain. No need to have a whole battle map or a grid. During the Clash of Arms your characters can choose a combat stance that is like your general strategy for what your character will be doing. Forward stance uh, gives you additional die for attack, but attacks against you also gain additional dice and you can try to intimidate your foes. The open stance, also close combat, gives you no advantages or disadvantages, so it's pretty much the default stance and you can rally your comrades as a combat task. The defensive stance makes you harder to hit because attacks aimed at you lose 1d6, but you also roll 1d6 for each opponent that is engaging you less. So it's defensive stance. The rearward stance is the one that can stand back and shoot the bow. Here's an illustration with like the different stances. Forward stance open stance, defensive stance, I guess, and the rearward stance. And I think that during combat, these roles might change. So if the one in the front is becoming tired, he will change to the open stance or the rearward stance. And the one in the defensive stance will probably try to shield the one in the forward stance because they have a better defense, they can protect companions, and they are most likely to get hit. So we've got a bit of strategy here. Damage is usually applied to your endurance, so it's not really runes, but more like bruises, getting winded, but they are also piercing blows. Piercing blow is struck if the feet dial rolls uh, a 10, or the rune of Gun of the Grey. You can flip that around for the GM. The GM rolls the Eye of Sauron, then he scores a piercing blow. And then to avoid getting a wound, you have to roll on your armor score and try to roll over the target number for the weapon. So each weapon will have an injury rating and the higher it is, the more lethal are the piercing blows of the weapon. So a dagger, it's only 14, a club, a cudgel, only 12, but something big and scary like a great axe, 20 is the number to beat. And your armor will give you a number of d6 to protect you from this injury. So if you only got a leather shirt, you take a feed die and 1d6 and try to beat the injury target number. For example, with this 5, yeah, it doesn't look good. Uh, so it works just the same as uh, any other roll, basically. Easy enough to remember. And if you become wounded, you check the wounded box and you can roll for wound severity. So uh, roll the Gandalf rune, it's not too hard, roll anything in the middle, it's a severe injury that will take days, maybe weeks to heal, so probably after the adventure. If you roll the Eye of Sauron, it's a grievous wound, you are knocked unconscious with zero endurance and are dying immediately. Also, if you are wounded a second time, 
Your endurance dropped to zero and you are unconscious and are now dying, same as a grievous wound. Council are special rules for a thing, a council. If your characters meet a number of important NPCs and they want a favor from them, they want to steer them to a certain course of action, you use the council rules. So first you set the resistance, then that you introduction, then interaction. The resistance is basically how hard is it? What are do the characters want? What is the disposition of the NPC they are talking to? Then they will introduce themselves. During that phase they can use their fame, uh, maybe even sing a song or recite a heroic poem to give them bonus dice for the interaction itself. And depending on the outcome, you uh, get the help you've asked for. Or maybe uh, if it's not so great, you get the help, but first you have to do something for them, or there's a condition. And if you fail spectacularly, you get kicked out and maybe have even made a powerful enemy. So. A bit like the Council of Elrond in The Lord of the Rings. Journey are the traveling rules. It uses a hex-based system to determine how long a journey takes and what resistance you may meet on the journey. They even got like a, a journey sheet you can use to, to draw part of the map and keep track of what has happened during the journey and you will uh, have a number of events that you have to roll to overcome basically and and there might be good or more likely bad outcomes that you will have to deal with once you reach your destination. So while there are rules for a journey and what happens during a journey it's more like you're actually fast forwarding through the journey and then summarize what has happened during the journey and what that means, what condition you arrive in on the next site of adventure. Fellowship phases are the times between adventures, uh, especially in winter. When the land is covered in snow and there's a bigger downtime, you can do certain uh, activities, like raising an heir. So this is the opportunity to uh, invest your experience, to recover your hard score, to lower your shadow score, to recover from injuries. You can gather rumors, heal, you can meet your patrons, raise an air, recount a story, strengthen the fellowship. You can prepare for the next adventures and take advantages with you from the fellowship phase. Lawmaster section gives you advice on how to run the game. Pretty Standard, you have probably seen this in other role-playing games before. And in here are the rules for the shadow. The shadow, if, the will, if you will, is the influence of the Dark Lord of Sauron. And it is exposing your character's flaws. So depending on your chosen calling, you get a different path of shadow like the curse of vengeance, dragon sickness, law of power, law of secrets, path of despair. Then depending on uh, how much shadow you have and how many bouts of madness you had, you get worse and worse manifestations of your shadow that uh, will complicate your adventuring. For example, from Lord of the Rings, Boromir would have the lure of power, 
And in that scene when he tried to take the ring of power from Frodo, he would have had a bout of madness and tried to take the ring despite his better knowledge. After the bout of madness was over, he realized what he had done and tried to make up for it. So, very thematic. Adversaries gives you rules how to handle your monsters and your NPCs. And uh, interestingly, they have a hate score that works like the hope score of the uh, players, but for your evil NPCs. They also differentiate between help, hate or resolve. So if you've got an evil NPC, a monster, a servant of the shadow, they have hate. But if you've got like a neutral party, they have resolve. They are not servants of the shadow. But servants of the shadow that have hate have special fell abilities that make them really dangerous. And these are listed with the individual monsters. We've got a good selection of monsters here that you might encounter in Middle-earth. Example, this great orc bodyguard has the fa fallibility hideous toughness. When the attacks inflicts damage to the creature that would cause it to go to zero endurance, it causes a piercing blow instead. Then, if the creature is still alive, it returns to full endurance. So you can wound this bodyguard, but he's very hard to kill. Treasure is handled in an abstract way. Rather than getting a fixed number of die or even items, mostly uh, you get a treasure score. And then you can roll the number of die depending on the treasure score to determine how big it actually is and maybe what you might find then the gm can uh, use a number of famous armors and weapons and magical items to give to the party and the GM should prepare uh, a list of such items that will fit into this campaign beforehand. The Eye of Mordor is like the influence of the Dark Lord personally, who is usually a very far away hands off evil presence. But if your group does too much to hinder his plans, then the eye will become aware and that may manifest in different ways. Maybe you just become very unlucky and you roll with ill favor or maybe uh, all the creatures you meet are very aggressive towards you. Then you will have to try and escape from this awareness to continue your adventures. Got a description of the world, uh, the region Ariado where this is set. Here we've got descriptions of the different regions within Ariado, points of interest, towns, uh, taverns maybe, and in here you will find rumors and adventure prompts to make your own adventures. This Forgotten Hamlet, for example, the big and the little, the twilight ships. You've got a rumor table for the prancing pony. You can use all of these to uh, make up your own adventures. And I like my rumor tables. The appendix has a list of the patrons that are introduced in this book. And finally, the landmark section. This is an adventure site. 
The star in the mist is a tower of a fortress that was once besieged by the forces of the shadow and now it's haunted by ghosts and there's a dwarven mine underneath and there's a hidden dwarven city even further underneath. So this gives you an adventure site with a description of locations and NPCs and what might happen, but not really a plot. So you have to see how your players will react if they encounter this adventure sites and then just go from there. And this is how I run my adventures too. So this adventure site, uh, it's pretty neat. Finally, Nameless Things is a monster generator that allows you to come up with a name, a description and stats and special abilities, even rumors about uh, a new monster you come up with. It's pretty comprehensive, very useful tool. Index, character sheet, map. So, the one ring, do I think about it? It's a strange beast. I want to love it, I love this scenario, but these rules are leaving me uh, uninspired, if you will. As a, a GM, I don't really know what I would do with it, what kind of campaign I would run in Ariadra. The rules are written for a specific play style. For a heroic adventuring party and for adventures that are not as epic as in the Lord of the Rings, honestly. So we've got more small time adventures, dungeon crawling, defeating minions of the shadow. And I'm actually fine with the playstyle. I it can work with that. I like the concept of playing through multiple generations of heroes. I can understand why you can't play wizards. The the rules, the combat rules, character creation and everything, that's fine. Though I would have wished to have a bit more <laughs> description of like the culture of these characters than just this bit. I would have loved to see at least a page only describing culture, customs, and, and fashion, for example. I love that stuff. This is very brief. What leaves me really uninspired are the, the rules for the journey, with the journey events, and then that is my table for the journey events. It's a very short table and basically I have to make up these events and then they have only a small consequence actually. This is not like events that will be important to the general plot or that will generate plot. This is just a, a small obstacle during the journey. And if that is the case, I don't really know why I should bother with this. Why should I bother with this if the outcome is gain a point of shadow? Here, let, let, me, let me show you a different game for comparison. This is the Forbidden Lands, also from Free League. It's a very similar game from like the scope of the adventures. But let me show you what this has for random encounters, random events during your travel through the hex map. 
This has a D66 grid. And then I have like 50 random events. It's 43. I've got 43 random events that are flavorful right off the bat, that may be important to the overarching plot, or that may lead to a plot. Uh, for example, you one of these events, you find a horse, beautiful horse with a well-crafted saddle, and in the saddlebag will be some gold and a signature ring from a noble. And from that can spawn an adventure. Whom did the horse belong to? Who was that noble? Then you can bring this ring back to the parents of the uh, noble adventurer who died on that horse and they may thank you. This will lead to, uh, to further adventure. So this is pretty good. This, is, this leaves me cold. Furthermore, this doesn't really help me in creating adventure sites. I love that I've got this description of the countryside with all the rumors in here, but when it comes to making actual adventure sites, all I've got is this one landmark, the Stars of the Mist, and there's only one. And this here book, it has an adventure generator allowing me to create villages, uh, villages, castles and dungeons and rumors and inhabitants and traps, everything you might find in there. Furthermore, this also has adventure sites. Instead of one, I've got two and three. So, so, this comes with thrice the number of adventure sites and it has tools in it to create more adventure sites. And this is missing from this book. It's just not there. This is not something for an inexperienced GM. To use this, you need to be able to make up your own adventures, your own locations, plots and NPCs. And it's not giving you a lot of help. So uh, I would recommend if you want to play this, get other books that help you with that task. For example, Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. Or even the Forbidden Lands could be used to create adventure sites for this. Now there is a book with uh, adventure, and there is an adventure volume coming out for the Ron Ring and I've pre-ordered it. And I hope they don't just have like 10 adventure locations in there, but also rules and tables to create more adventure locations. Because this core rule book just feels incomplete to me. And I think that will be my final verdict of this rule set serviceable, beautifully illustrated, a bit limited in scope and incomplete. I would advise you if you are interested in this, wait for a bit. Wait until the core rules are expanded on, until at least the adventure volume is out because this doesn't give you everything you need to play. Anyway, that's it for today. Thanks for watching and goodbye.